Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Studying Educational Effectiveness in Rural Settings webinar. Slide. Rail Central at Marzano Research will be your webinar host today. We serve the educational region that covers Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. I'm going to take just a few seconds to explain the webinar platform structure so that you'll be able to use both a closed captioning aspect and a Q&A panel. As you will note, this webinar is being live captioned. If you need to access the live captioning, the aspect of the chat panel, which is a window that will open, provides a link to the caption. Go to that link, click on, and you should be automatically entered into the live captioning software. Once the webinar has begun, the live captioning will happen. This will continue throughout the webinar and close at the end. If you have any questions or concerns about the, the live captioning, please feel free to post a questionnaire either in the chat room or in the Q&A box. The Q&A panel will mute all participants, but we'll be using this panel to ask folks to communicate at different places and spaces throughout the webinar. Um, I'll um, pose questions or ask folks to share their experiences during certain parts of the webinar, and we'll ask folks to please answer that in this chat panel. Again, if you have any questions or concerns or are unable to access the, the Q&A panel, please post questions in the chat panel or vice versa. We'll be monitoring both throughout the webinar. I'd like to introduce um, our wonderful presenters for, from today's webinar. Um, they're from the National Center for Research on Rural Education at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Susan Sheridan, Professor and Director, and James Oviar, Associate Professor and Director of two different uh, centers within the um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We've included their email addresses in this slide. Um, if you want to reach out to them after the webinar, we know that they're very happy to answer questions or share more information about the center and their different work. We also want to point out um, that this webinar is based on a fabulous publication um, that was written by our presenters and their colleagues um, at the National Center. Um, we, will have, we will also post a link to that report in the webinar chat, so if you wish to follow along in that document as we go throughout the webinar, but it's also a fabulous publicly available resource that you can download and access at any time. It's available through their website and also the link that we've provided. I'd like to now turn the webinar over to our two presenters, Susan and Jim. They'll start out by talking a little bit about the National Center for Research on Rural Education. We'll talk a little bit about the goals and purposes of the webinar, and then we'll begin the webinar itself. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Susan. Hi, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jim Averd. I'm an associate professor in educational psychology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and also the director of our Nebraska Center for Research, Nebraska Academy for Methodology, Analytics, and Psychometrics, which is part of the Nebraska Center for Research on Children, Youth, Families, and Schools. Uh, Susan, Susan was our, our PI on the National Center for Research on Rural Education, and she'll be uh, speaking here in a little bit. And I was a co-PI on the, the grant funded by the U.S. Department of Education Institute of Education Sciences. This grant was housed within our center CYFS here at, at UNL and has obviously provided the, the majority of the funding for our, our rural research work over the last uh, half decade or so. Go to the next. Yeah. Uh, the long-term goals of this, this center are to are twofold. One is to improve rural students' academic and social behavioral skills uh, by ideeing strategies that lead to evidence-based practices in rural settings. And then two, to establish that infrastructure for conducting and disseminating such uh, relevant research to, to you, the practitioners, and the rural research uh, field as, as a whole. 
Throughout the rest of the webinar, we're going to cover four areas that you can see on the screen. We're going to talk about study design, recruitment participants, supporting and monitoring implementation, as well as data collection. I'm going to tackle the first uh, topic, study design, as well as the fourth, data collection. And Susan will be stepping in to, to talk about sections two and three. Okay. All right. So. Factor one, uh, planning and effectiveness study. I'm a methodologist by training, uh, and so this is one of my, my key areas here. Uh, and I, I expect to an extent I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here uh, in that a number of you, if not all of you, have already conducted research in rural settings, or at least are, are, are sophisticated consumers of such work. But I'll point out, start off by pointing out and just reminding that you know, research is research and statistics are statistics, kind of regardless of the context, whether it's a rural setting or an urban setting. Uh, the fundamental piece to, to any research enterprise is, is the set of research questions that drive those uh, endeavors. Uh, these the questions really are paramount. Um, while the, the whole process of, of research uh, really doesn't vary between rural or urban settings. Uh, the types of questions that are that are asked uh, can differ quite a bit between between the two contexts. Not necessarily in importance, um, but in, in the content that the, the, the questions are, are addressing. And ultimately that research question leads to any of the decisions that we should make in terms of our experimental design. Since we're talking today about planning an effectiveness study and conducting and eventually analyzing uh, effectiveness studies, we are talking about a context that is more quantitative rather than qualitative. Uh, and so the, the requisite designs uh, as supported uh, by the Institute of Education Sciences are, are randomized control trials, the RCT, or uh, strong quasi-experimental designs such as regression discontinuity design. Our goal here in, in asking a research, an effectiveness research question, designing a study uh, to test such a question is to ideally determine causality. Does this intervention, this program, this practice uh, lead to better results? Uh, when that's not possible, our, our alternative is to look at the quasi designs where we're looking for well-controlled uh, studies in terms of controlling the, the internal validity of our inferences. The RCT is obviously preferred uh, in, in terms of establishing causality. In RCT, we're establishing two or more groups through random assignment. Uh, if random assignment is effective and properly done, these two groups should be equivalent, at least statistically speaking. Uh, and if done well, a, an RCT should give us increased faith in the, in the inference that we make from that. Now, we're always cautioned that there are, uh, there are other conditions that may lead to explanations of any group differences besides assignment to condition, uh, but those tend to be averaged out by the random assignment. Uh, in small sample cases, obviously, we're going to consider uh, covariates. Quasi-experiments then are done when those randomized control trials are not feasible. Um, but we should not have the same confidence in the results of those as we would uh, an RCT, because there are those other explanations that aren't controlled, uh, primarily related to the, the natural assignment to condition versus random assignment. So there's more work that has to be done in terms of controlling those well-known threats to internal validity, and this is accomplished by both design features and statistical controls. At the end of the day, we acknowledge the limitations uh, of such quasi-experiments, and we use that evidence that we are able to gain uh, through a quasi-experimental design to build our, our knowledge base. Again, research is research, regardless of context, uh, and so some contexts, particularly the rural context, create different challenges than others. Uh, these challenges are often uh, attributed to the distance between uh, population entities, the, the, the density or lack thereof of the population in the rural context, and the costs and logistical limitations that are associated with, with getting access to those, uh, those widespread resources. But the context is important, especially in the, the rural setting, especially the local context, and so we do encourage a mixed methods approach to measuring and incorporating that context. Uh, whether that's through the various rural definitions that are available uh, or whether they're through uh, a true mixed methods type design 
that would allow us to incorporate more qualitative information into the, the RCD or the qualitative context. Our center has done quite a bit of work on, on measuring rurality uh, and, and continue to do so. Uh, so please look for our work in the future. In terms of statistics, it's always the unit assignment that's important, not always the, the number of, of students. So a reminder that the, the group level uh, that is assigned to condition to determines the complexity of, of the design and, and the research question that's, that's driving it. Uh, when schools are units of assignment, then we're encouraged to, to look at matching and stratification, trying to select a homogeneous sample when possible, and to consider alternative uh, designs within the RCT context, such as crossover designs where participants receive both conditions, or step wedge and weightless control type designs where participants serve as their own controls. Now, when classrooms or teachers are, are units of assignment instead of the schools, then we can look for a little bit of creativity within the, the school setting in terms of assigning different grades to conditions. Uh, you know, if we are going to assign classrooms to conditions, we always have to be aware of the possibility of contamination, the, the so-called teacher's lounge effect. Uh, and we might also cons uh, recommend considering alternatives such as single case uh, or, or small in designs. And I encourage you to look at the What Works Clearinghouse guidelines for, for for some guidance there. Uh, when we are assigning classroom or school as the assignment uh, unit, uh, I also encourage you to consider things such as planned missing data designs, uh, so-called efficient measurement uh, approaches, whether these are cohort sequential or accelerated designs uh, in longitudinal settings, adaptive interventions, the so-called smart designs that are becoming very popular, uh, adaptive testing, such as computerized adaptive testing, which is used in most major uh, testing platforms nowadays, uh, or sequentially designed experiments, which allow for uh, various decision points. All of these planned missing data type designs can, can lead to a, uh, a, a lower burden in terms of the data necessary to address the research questions. And also just the, the the well-supported regression discontinuity design. That's another one that uh, really doesn't get enough press in terms of, it, it, of its causal uh, inference uh, and its control for, for threats to, to validity. So with that, I'll uh, leave my, my lecture here, so to speak, and turn it on over to the panel. Thank you, Jim. Um, I, we would love to hear from folks if they've had a successful research experience using any of these kind of designs, whether it's RCT or quasi-experimental design, or if they went a project that would uh, use mixed methods they found particularly helpful. You as practitioners experience these researchers' um, experiences and methods in very different ways than we as researchers. So if there were um, projects you've been involved on that um, looked at different aspects of rurality, as Jim mentioned, that had sort of longitudinal design that looked at particular kinds of strategies in classrooms or across schools or across the district. We just love folks to populate either in the Q&A box or in the chat room any kind of um, experiences you've had that were successful. What were the aspects of that? Was it about the research design? Was it about um, the ability to use different kinds of data? What was a, suggest a successful experience you had? And we'll give folks a few minutes and then I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a couple and then we'll move on to the second factor.
Thank you, everyone. A couple examples that have come up is a project that actually somebody talked about college and career readiness. And they said that was a longitudinal study that looked at different aspects of dual enrollment and dual credit um, that were used in a couple of rural settings. Um, they said one important piece of that was that it was the fact that it was longitudinal so that they could look at different cohorts of students over time, but also in the, in the, in the sense that the researchers and the practitioners work together with the community colleges and the other sort of of um, areas of education to really sort of develop that partnership and to sort of commit to looking at information long term. So that was one that sort of used both mixed methods, but also had a longitudinal aspect. Another uh, uh, group talked about um, an early um, reading intervention uh, project that looked at uh, that used classrooms as the sort of uh, data point. Um, it was sort of a quasi experimental design. Um, this one was uh, mostly sort of quasi-experimental, both um, for sort of uh, feasibility and cost, but also that that was sort of a kind of traditional uh, research technique that the district um, was familiar with and was um, probably more sort of um, happy to participate in than some of the sort of more robust designs. Thank you everybody for sharing. We'll now go on to the factor number two, and I will uh, hand the webinar back to Jim and Susan. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I'm Sue Sheridan, and I'm happy to be here with you all today as well. Um, I'll be talking about the next factor in um, conducting rural research, which is an issue around recruitment. Now, as all of you know, um, as much as we know, that a reality of rural schools is their small size, their um, dispersion geographically across sometimes many, many, many miles, and uh, the fact that rural communities tend to be quite tight knit. Um, all of these things actually, we think, are strengths of rural communities. Um, but they do present some challenges to researchers who are trying to conduct research, especially rigorous research and large scale research, um, the kind that Jim talked about primarily and um, that is required for determining the efficacy of interventions that are happening in rural schools. Um, the fact that I'll mention just a couple um, challenges associated with these realities. As I mentioned, rural communities tend to be very close-knit. They tend to be generally stable. They're often quite homogeneous. Um, and because everyone knows everyone else, there's sometimes a, um, a fear of stigma. If the research that is being conducted involves some psychological or educational assessments, or to have some personal issues like family history or mental health issues. Um, this is complicated by the fact that researchers tend to be unknown entities. So the community is very tight knit and very close, but the researchers coming in are external to that community. And so there could be some distrust or skepticism about whether or not we're really going to be able to protect the privacy and confidentiality of um, folks in the study. Related to this is the fact that rural schools often don't participate in research. They're not as accustomed to participating in research as say in some urban areas where so much of our educational research is conducted. So there's not a lot of information among stakeholders at the, at the rural level about what's involved and, and how research actually is quite different in some, in some cases from standard practice. So this could create a real big surprise for administrators and educators or family members who are asked to participate in things like being randomly assigned to a treatment group or a control group, or to systematically implement research procedures in a certain way with fidelity, or using standardized intervention protocols or data collection methods that are, that are a little bit foreign to what is typical in real classrooms. Now, on the one hand, um, these are aspects of high quality research designs, but admittedly, they are um, atypical in many rural settings. Logistical challenges are probably the biggest concern that people think about when they think about um, doing research in rural schools. Low enrollments is one logistical issue. I mean, in some places, classrooms can be as few as 10 students with far fewer than 100 students or so per school. 
Um, and because both rural schools and classrooms typical are typically um, pretty low in enrollment, it's sometimes necessary for researchers to recruit participants from many schools and many districts dispersed over very large geographic areas. And this obviously will introduce barriers associated with cost, um, both in terms of time and financial resources. And by just increasing the number of districts and the number of different schools and different counties and regions that might um, begin to populate our research, we're gonna start seeing some differences on some key demographic areas. And so this can complicate some of the research designs that we're using. If you're in need of a specific type of population, say children with a particular disability or from a particular ethnic group, access can be a problem. And, and, and it can result in a plateau effect such that just by increasing the number of schools or classrooms, we might result, that might result in only a very small number of students um, still being eligible. And one more logistical issue that you might not think about is the sheer numbers of roles that each person in a rural school will play. As a researcher, we don't necessarily think about that. You all know that in your daily work, but, but it is the case that administrators and teachers and all the stakeholders in a rural school and community will wear many hats. They'll assume duties outside of the classroom, for example, such as um, coaching teams or advising extracurricular activities or supporting clubs or doing a lot of things that need to be done and there's just not a lot of other human capital available for. So although these are positive aspects at times around, you know, the sense that rural educators will do whatever it takes to make the school run, um, quick, you know, uh, very effectively, it does decrease educators' abilities to um, dedicate time to research participation. So we have to be very sensitive to those kinds of things. The reality is, is that recruitment will take more time, it'll take more effort, it'll take more resources, it'll really take more collaboration than uh, what, what we might be um, accustomed to or what we might realize. For researchers and rural school practitioners then who want to participate, in research. And there are many people in rural schools who really want to engage in this kind of work because it is providing an opportunity to have a voice and to represent um, all of the strengths and realities and uh, opportunities present in rural schools. It will, though, take some creativity and some flexibility, um, you know, a real opportunity to come together and do what it takes. And fortunately, so many rural educators have that attitude that they'll do what it takes to help further um, the good for all of education and for students, particularly in those types of schools. Some of the solutions or strategies that we might talk about, um, first entering this work, just knowing that it's gonna be more, um, more costly. It will require more funds or at least more resources um, to do the kind of work that when you're in a larger school district that's more flush with human and, and sometimes material resources, um, it, it will require us to think more creatively in rural settings. Sometimes um, we'll see schools where they'll actually write job descriptions to um, support um, external efforts around research or program development. We always dedicate on our side, on the research team, we dedicate percentages of some of our staff, some of their um, time to providing re recruitment support and, and being specialists when it comes to um, recruitment. Um, we hire people who have very good people skills, who are well organized, who are flexible, who are able to go out and spend time in the rural schools um, and really get to know the community and the individuals in the buildings and learn about what's important to them, what's realistic for them, and, and how we might be able to join forces and, and, and work together to create a, a good research project. Um, technology can be an asset when recruiting in, in uh, rural schools, but before I say anything more about that, I, I will just caution us to remember that technology is not a silver bullet 
Um, it's not a panacea. Um, it does not take the place of the human touch. And relationships, conversations, time spent together in the school are all really, really important to not only educators, but to researchers, or at least researchers who really want to understand um, how uh, education in, in rural settings uh, really does their business. So it's really important for intervention research where we're aimed at improving some practices or building school capacity to have the opportunity to get to know one another because by rolling up our sleeves and working together, that's how we'll actually see some real positive change taking place. But really any type of research that we're doing will always be best when it's done in a partnership mentality. Getting in the door is always easier when we have these personal connections. So we try to do face-to-face -face meetings first and then follow up with technology like this platform, Zoom or WebEx or conference calls or any other kinds of technology that we might need to answer questions and logistics, but only after we really spend some time on uh, the front end, getting to know one another and build trust. Um, we do have to keep in mind that not all rural schools across the country have high-speed internet. Uh, if we're working with families, which our center does a lot of, um, not all families are going to have access to Wi-Fi. A cell service might be better, but not always. And so we just need to always you know, keep an open mind in terms of the ways that we might be able to reach out and communicate. One thing that we have found in, in our work with practitioners in, in rural schools is that having some school district liaisons or champions, you might think of them as, is a real useful way to, um, to connect and build relationships. Depending on the study that we're doing, we sometimes recruit someone from within the district to serve as a liaison between our study and the educators who are sort of on the ground, so to speak. Because um, this person really does know the ins and outs of the school building. If, if, if they're carefully selected, and we really work with our partners and our administrators to identify who would really you know, be the right person to serve in this role, um, somebody who is trusted and reliable, somebody who is legitimate, somebody who has credibility um, among educators on the ground and, and families in the community, or depending on whom it is that we're trying to recruit, that can be really helpful for both sides because it can be a sounding board for us as researchers to learn about the best way to really um, demonstrate our commitment to, to working together. But it's also helpful for people in the school who have questions about the study or the researchers or the procedures and things like that. And so this liaison serves as a really nice bridge. Um, if that's not possible, then sometimes we'll situate somebody from the research team in a school building, for, especially for high-profile events like family school conference nights or other um, school events, teacher planning time, um, a few weeks before school begins when teachers have more flexibility, and we can talk and we can explore ideas and we can really figure out the best ways to work together um, because that personal connection, again, is, is another way uh, to, to increase the types of collaboration that are necessary for really effective recruitment to take place. So with that, um, we'll turn it over to the Q&A. Thank you, Susan. Again, I invite folks to share either a success or a challenge they faced in terms of recruitment or even being recruited to uh, participate in a research project. Uh, logistical, um, being overwhelmed by too many, too many things on your plate, um, staffing issues, access to um, different uh, resources. Please uh, share a success or a challenge. I'll give everybody a couple minutes here and then I'll sh share a few out. Thank you, everyone.
thank you, everyone. Um, Claire, thank you for sharing. Um, she says this is a project that involved um, using existing relationships with different uh, regional education associations. Um, and that way that you sort of already have access to different schools, access to different folks that you've worked with before. Uh, Rachel also shared one. Thank you, my dear. Um, a real problem that she identified was having uh, chronic student absenteeism, which of course really affects data collection. It's really difficult to have consistent information, but also, you know, uh, usable information, especially when we think of something we're doing longitudinal studies or something like that. Um, thank you, ladies, for sharing. We really appreciate it. Um, we'll go move on to the next factor, which is factor three, um, and we'll pass it back over to Jim and Susan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And thank you for the folks who are participating via questions. Those are really excellent questions uh, and some that we absolutely do deal with, both in terms of um, trying to figure out site by site who that best contact is, if it's somebody in an ESU, which is what they're called here in Nebraska or an REA, um, or somebody at the building level. Um, and certainly issues of absenteeism are uh, really germane in many different types of school settings, not just rural. Um, the next thing we'll be talking about is monitoring, supporting and monitoring implementation in rural areas. And this is particularly um, related to intervention research where we're implementing programs or strategies um, and testing the potential efficacy or the efficacy of the intervention. Um, these do require some large samples typically, uh, and they require a lot of attention to what it is that the practitioners are doing on the ground. And so um, there's, there's obviously a real critical role for implementation fidelity in our intervention research, ensuring that our programs or strategies are implemented with fidelity, so they, so to speak, um, is really, really um, at the heart of being able to identify what works for whom and under what kinds of conditions. If we don't have fidelity in our intervention work, then we will really have no confidence at all in uh, the final data that, that, we're, that we're reporting on. So we really need to have some support for implementation fidelity, um, especially if we want to communicate out to other educators about what does work in rural schools. Um, and what kinds of professional development resources um, should be devoted to these strategies. Research teams like ours, who are concerned with ensuring fidelity of program implementation, um, are often located at places like the universities or training centers that are quite distal to rural school partners. Again, this, this issue of geographic dispersion or distance really um, wreaks havoc when our preferences are to be on site and to be working closely with, with practitioners who are parts of our studies. Um, but this kind of um, distance really does make it difficult to do so. So we, as many others, um, although we prefer on-site training and, and coaching supports, we've figured out ways to um, try and address some of these, these challenges, these logistical challenges associated with distance. Um, complicating the, the challenge of distance, though, is the fact that the rural schools that we work with often don't have a lot of um, additional personnel, materials, or specialized expertise to provide some of the additional support, the ongoing support that is so important when we're learning new strategies. So we, again, um, ha have really tried to blend some of the training and ongoing supports with some technical um, support, some, some strategies related to web-based or virtual training that allow us to have more frequent, regular, and consistent connections with that folks in the field. Um, and, and be creative in how we're using those platforms. And so although I said that technology is not a panacea, it is the case that it provides the opportunity to increase the access that we have with participants and that participants in the field have with us. 
again, um, I'll sound like a broken record, but I will say that the effectiveness of using technology, whether it be web-based or other forms, um, to support implementation um, and fidelity does assume a good relationship first and foremost. And so whatever we can do to build trust, to build a partnership, to build a type of mentoring and coaching relationship where there's freedom to try things, take risks, and learn um, you know, how to, to best approach the work together is one that's going to be most effective. Uh, we, there are many, many easily accessible and web-based training environments that allow schools and districts to participate in pro program implementation training. Um, so we can really utilize um, different platforms to reach a lot of different schools or districts simultaneously. Um, we also use websites to house training materials. So participants in our studies um, can access instructional videos or podcasts, um, interactive presentations. We even use, you know, we'll have some brief criterion-based quizzes um, or reminders or booster sessions available all online so that people can access them 24-7 from anywhere they might be located. Um, we put together implementation forms, all of those checklists, lesson plans, and scripts. Everything is easily stored on project websites. And so, so there is some static ways, too, that we can provide information. Um, but, but whenever possible, we add to that static um, platform interactive opportunities through chat rooms and um, virtual teacher lounges and things like that. All of these are really um, helpful and useful um, means for providing um, access to information as much as possible. And there's many other researchers who have very interesting and creative um, um, models available online that have um, coaching, live coaching using Bluetooth technology or um, other kinds of web-based um, media-based means for some um, live or close to live types of feedback mechanisms. Um, now that type of training is really important for research where participants are responsible for implementing new practices. But I will say that the kinds of communication that I talked about earlier, open communication between the research team and participants is really important for all kinds of research. So if you're participating in a study, for example, that's collecting data on your uh, students from preschool through early elementary years, it's still important that there's integrity in the data collection process. So, um, so, Helping our teachers or administrators or our family members, whomever it is that's participating, um, understand how to complete the surveys, whether they be paper and pencil surveys or tablet-based surveys, or collecting video, video to do observations and sending some um, memory cards back through the mail or downloading video onto a secure website. We have to help our um, folks um, together figure out the best way that they can set up the equipment and capture good reliable data um, and understand how the importance of the integrity of the data drives everything when it comes to really answering the important research questions. Again, um, these are best done through partnerships and working together to figure out the best way to um, generate data that will be meaningful. Um, so uh, let's talk then about some methods or strategies for monitoring implementation because there are ways to set it up so that we can increase the um, potential for having good data, um, good interventions. Um, but how do we know? How can we monitor it and, and have data that will really give us confidence that um, our studies are um, really reliable and valid? Well, um, we will uh, emphasize in our research very careful, very systematic monitoring of our interventions. Um, without this, we just can't really make adjustments even to know if the implementation is being um, accurate 
and reliable. Um, because if it's not, you know, we might be able to step in and do some things to help folks um, in their process. We use fidelity checklists whenever possible. These are very easy and practical forms that whenever possible we co-create with our practice um, partners um, because they can then help us understand the easiest and most straightforward but um, reliable way of collecting those data. When we co-create the measure, we're ensured that our practitioners that are our partners understand the implementation steps, that they um, know what's expected, and that they buy into it. And when the steps of an intervention are written down, we're all able then to monitor how it is that things are being implemented. Many of our interventions will produce permanent products. And but what I mean by this would be things like sticker charts or homeschool notes or a contracts that might be established between a student and a teacher, goals that are being set and um, charts that are being used to collect data on those goals are all permanent products that are really um, a nice and simple way to monitor fidelity. So if we collect those records, we will have some evidence that the, some of the intervention components anyway are being completed. So we really do try to create permanent products for all of our interventions and do so in a way where the different steps of implementing that intervention can be um, checked off or marked or at least initialed so that some of the elements um, will be um, recognized. Now that's not um, a perfect way to collect fidelity data because not everything will be subject to a permanent product. Um, but when used with some other forms, we might have a multiple you know, method approach to having data about implementation. I alluded to the issue or the use of videos a couple of minutes ago. Um, and um, I do think that that is becoming a much more acceptable way of collecting data in many, many schools. Obviously, districts and schools will have their own policies, and teachers will ultimately have the final say about whether they're willing to have some of their classroom practices, their students in their classrooms monitored by video. But when it's, it is the case that um, society today is much more comfortable with cameras and videos uh, than ever before and and they become so practical and non intrusive that it's it's really quite easy to go to go into a classroom and um, establish through uh, an I some some kind of smart technology or GoPro cameras or things like that uh, ways to capture what's happening in the classrooms um, and then send those videos back to the lab where we can do the coding and um, the deep uh, analysis that's necessary. These can be really, really helpful. They're also very helpful in coaching and, and supporting the, um, the fidelity work that we talked about. That's happening more and more now in a lot of educational research in rural settings. So um, those are my thoughts about fidelity, and we'll turn it over to the panel. Thank you, Susan. Um, again, I want to invite folks to uh, post a success or a challenge they've had around um, supporting or monitoring implementation. Again, it might be use of different kind of checklists, um, different kind of training, um, just-in-time coaching, um, different kind of resources that people can uh, access. Again, use of videos or recordings, um, anything like that, folks, please share.
Thank you, Caitlin. Caitlin um, noted that she's had some challenges with trying to do this kind of video observation. So, um, Caitlin, I'm going to I'm going to save your question to the end. Um, I think we'll have a couple minutes um, for Jim and Susan to kind of give some different ideas um, and maybe some best advice they've had as well. But that is definitely one um, thinking about trying to do video observations and or just sort of document um, audio and video um, communications can be can be a challenge. Um, Rebecca also offered that she's had a, a challenge sort of using backend data from different kind of computerized tools in the in the classroom you know, where students are um, either manipulating um, uh, via computers or tablets or different things like that where that's part of the data collection and that can be uh, both sort of um, technologically challenging but also um, sort of creating those data repositories and accessing that data can be a bit of a challenge. Um, Melissa noted that they've used different Google Forms to enter data, and that's really allows sort of real-time access to the program implementation of the data. And also, the nice thing about uh, using Google Forms is that everybody can see the nature of the data, so you can have some consistency around that. And then we've got another one here. Um, Rachel also talked about that they do different kind of trainings every other month to make sure that folks are kind of up to speed and sharing consistent information um, that helps to uh, not only create buy-in, but keep buy-in going um, and also um, allows people to feel um, involved throughout. Um, and then again, uh, Melissa gives a good time-honored one that we we experience every day when we try to send out surveys and links is that, um, you know, district emails so it's often block um, information coming in through firewalls, and so you have to be sort of both sort of creative, but also um, work with districts to be able to have that kind of constant communication and, and challenges. So we've got a couple of questions I'm going to leave out there. We'll circle back to it. But Claire posed a really good question, and she sort of um, uh, gave us a nice segue for factor four, uh, which is talking about... Um, different strategies for collecting data, but especially around participant incentives. So we'll leave your question to the end, Claire, and we'll circle back to that. But thank you so much for posting that. That was a great segue to factor four. All right. Yeah, so I'm welcome back. Uh, this is Jim again. I want to talk here about this last uh, set of, of topics. Uh, so collecting outcome data. Uh, I started with a bit of an anecdote when in the first topic I'll start it again. I'll just say technology, 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 and partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Uh, while you know, we have been talking about planning and conducting and monitoring and collecting data on effectiveness studies, and as I said earlier, that is largely a quantitative world, we do support strongly a, a multimodal approach, whether it's a, a mixed methods or, or multiple perspectives kind of approach, especially when it comes to collecting outcome data and the way that we go about collecting outcome data. Uh, so as, as Sue has said a couple times now, technology isn't that magic wand and that, that all-in-one solution to all the logistical problems, but uh, technology sure is making things interesting for us in terms of our, our ability to collect data and whether it is through utilizing distance uh, meeting or teaching technology such as Zoom or WebEx or Adobe Connect uh, to conduct focus groups. Uh, or utilizing smartphones uh, and, and or, or, or text devices. As I'm old enough, I still want to call them pager studies, but uh, the modern term of ecological momentary assessments uh, are, are very, very useful in terms of collecting real-time longitudinal and intensive data. Uh, we are exploring the usage of those types of technologies quite a bit now within our center, as well as developing iPhone apps uh, to enable us to do several progress monitoring, fidelity type activities, as well as primary outcome uh, data collection. We utilize tablets in terms of in-class data collection instead of trying to minimize the pencil and paper as much as possible, uh, primarily because those tablets or netbooks or some other type of direct data uh, collection cuts out a lot of data entry errors, uh, cuts out a lot of data transportation issues in terms of integrating that data back into our, our centralized database. Uh, and as well as obviously the web-based data collections in, in addition to platforms like Zoom, uh, et cetera, uh, utilizing things like SurveyMonkey or, or, or other brands of, of online survey instrumentation programs, uh, even considering online tests uh, 
or, or measurements directly. And we've also, you, we were talking earlier, Sue was talking earlier about web-based classroom observations, having the camera in the room, uh, utilizing those not just for, for fidelity assessment, but observation of, of direct student outcomes uh, when, when appropriate and permitted, obviously, by the, the schools. So consider, consider a multimodal approach to your data collection. And again, like uh, fitting the research design uh, to appropriately test the research question, choosing your, your outcome methodology uh, to fit, fit the data that you really need to, to address your questions. Then partnership, partnership, partnership. Uh, rural settings, uh, as you all well know, are, 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 are widely dispersed in most cases, and, and access uh, to those are difficult. And so we really strongly encourage partnering with, with local and regional staff, uh, hiring local data collectors, hiring a, working with a little a local data collection manager uh, when possible and feasible. This helps improve the commitment to the project, strengthens those partnerships, and uh, probably most importantly, provides that on-the-ground knowledge of the context. Uh, that person who is present uh, is able to help fill in the blanks, some of those absentee is, absenteeism issues that were uh, raised earlier sometimes can be ameliorated by use, utilizing that, that on-the-ground data collection person. Uh, the, the problem, obviously, is that those local staff are already wearing multiple hats. Uh, and, and as one of the, the questions or comments uh, said, you know, the, the number one thing that they would like as an incentive is more time in the day or less responsibility. And here we'd be adding uh, some responsibilities to them. So we have to be, be creative sometimes in, in terms of those those incentives that we might be able to provide to them. Uh, yeah, obviously we know that incentives increase those participation rates uh, for the participants. It increases the, the particip participation rates of the partners on the local grounds. Um, really, I, I don't know that we have a, a great answer in terms of the magic solution to any of this. We tend to, like most things that we do, consider a multi a multimodal uh, approach to this, uh, pre versus prepaid versus uh, or contingent uh, incentives. Uh, we've done a lot. We've used ex digital incentives a lot lately. Something that you can use online. You know, maybe something fun, Amazon or, or iPhone or Apple uh, type credits. Uh, or more practically speaking, give them something, you know, you know, Walmart or the local grocery store, if there are some types of, of uh, you know, credits in there that can be given. Something that makes their life easier. Even if you're adding time to them, is there something you can do to make life easier? One of the other aspects that we've gotten good feedback on is when we do work with these local partners for data collection, that there's some some level of professional development uh, and or training that's that's coupled with that, that participation. So again, even though they're giving us some of their most precious resource at additional time, um, they're getting something at, back out of it. We're not just utilizing them um, for, for their man hours. So. The last thing that I'll, I'll talk about here before we uh, pass on to the last question and answer session is to again emphasize the idea of planning. Uh, and, and planning your data system ahead of time. We spend a lot of time planning our studies, and then a lot of times the, the resulting data system is an afterthought. Um, I really encourage you to, to plan your data systems early and with the same vigor that you uh, plan your, your overall design, and including looking at other sources uh, of data that might be able to address some of your questions. Uh, most states, all states, have some degree of, of state longitudinal data systems. Some are more developed than others. Sometimes those data systems, they don't provide necessarily outcomes, but they can provide a lot of the, the uh, surrounding information that we might uh, use to better, better answer our questions, uh, including looking at, at census data. Uh, here in Nebraska, we partnered with a couple, well, a couple neighboring states to create a regional data center supported by the U.S. Census Bureau. 
and those census uh, data centers come with them access to uh, just a plethora uh, of regional and national data systems that we can integrate uh, with in terms of our, our local projects. Uh, and then just consider those planned missing data designs that I referred to earlier in the, the presentation. Um, when data uh, is, at, is at a premium, and observations are hard to come by. Plan what you need and what you don't need, what you what you can do without. So, thank you for your time. We'll pass it back to the question and answer panel. Thank you, Jim. Again, we'd love folks to share um, any examples of successes or challenges they've had with either collecting data in rural areas or um, accessing information, um, other questions about incentives. Um, anything folks would like to share, we'll take a minute or two. And then we have a few minutes here at the end for um, other just sort of general questions you have of our panelists. So please feel free to post anything in the Q&A uh, or in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, again, some folks different, um, again, sort of emphasize what you said about the different kinds of incentives. Sometimes that's um, a $30 gift card somewhere. Again, sometimes that's access to other kinds of online resources they might use in their classroom. Um, sometimes, as he said, it, it can be um, uh, credits um, at sort of uh, online emporiums for different kind of resources or something like that. Um, Another, another folks mentioned, again, that is, as they said, the partnership at the local level, hiring local um, staff, um, might be retired teachers, might be, um, you know, former classroom uh, assistants to help with the data collection, to help sort of manage that sort of just-in-time um, on-site uh, pieces. Folks, any other questions, please um, ask, uh, post in the Q&A or the chat room. Our, um, our panelists would be happy to, to talk about that. Um, Caitlin did post an earlier um, question about um, video, um, the use of video. Go ahead and mute me. Yeah, um, I, I will answer that question because it is um, really germane to um, getting high quality data. We use video a lot, and we have found the uh, quality of the uh, webcams or even the technologies available through um, uh, our notebooks and our, um, you know, the iPads and things like that to be really, really good. Um, so we do train our teachers in setting up the cameras. Um, we will sometimes send somebody out and you know, do some troubleshooting prior to beginning the study and even do a couple trial runs before we actually do um, set up the cameras to actually collect real data so that we are able to do some troubleshooting with them before the actual data collection sessions begin. Um, we're always available to answer questions online um, and, um, you know, I think being selective, the, the GoPro cameras work really well, but so do a lot of this other, you know, smaller, you know, smart technologies. So it really does um, depend on what works for you in your settings. Um, finding one place to set up a camera will really capture quite a, a large scope. Um, so we can, and the audio um, has been really good. So I'm happy, and we are happy, both Jim and I are happy to follow up with any individuals who um, didn't have their questions answered. You have our email address, so please feel free to reach us, um, and we'll be happy to continue the, the dialogue because it's such an important topic for research. 
Thank you, Jim and Susan. Once again, we really appreciate you taking your time and sharing your uh, extensive experience and fabulous resources. If you have any questions, concerns, or want um, access, um, email information about uh, contacting Jim or Susan or more information about their center, uh, Mary Piantek is me uh, and my fabulous colleague, Kara. Uh, our information and contact information is there, or you can also just reach out to us through Marzano Research or through Rail Central. Thank you, everyone, for participating. We really appreciate your time and effort um, and your sharing of good ideas, advice, uh, experiences. Um, thank you all again. Have a fabulous afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.